Things just got very interesting for the Atlanta Falcons. After losing on the road to a Saints team that had lost seven in a row, fired their head coach, and traded away their star cornerback, the Atlanta Falcons now sit at 6-4. and four. And before the season began, what was the number one storyline going into this year after signing Kirk Cousins? It was the Falcons have the easiest schedule. They had the 32nd schedule in the NFL in terms of strength of schedule, level of difficulty. But sitting at 6-4, and four, we can peek at the playoff picture. Had they beat the Saints, which I know, woulda, coulda, shoulda, they'd be 7-3, and three, have the tiebreaker over the Eagles, eyeing the two seed, maybe giving the Lions a run for their money and just surprising everyone, getting a first round bye, but not a bad consolation prize if you miss out getting the one seed to at least be the two seed and lock up two home playoff games. But instead of all that happening, no, the Falcons are tested big time this Sunday. And we're going to find out what this team is made of because they had a crushing loss, but it wasn't the most soul-crushing loss of the day on Sunday. No one had it worse than the Broncos. They marched down the field, converted three times on third down, got into field goal range, one second remaining, 35 yards to win, give the Chiefs their biggest rival the first loss of the year. Instead, it's blocked, and now both these teams walk into Week 11 with their tail between their legs for very different reasons, but both these teams are going to find out what their locker room is made out of, which is why I'm very excited for this matchup because it feels like a coin toss game. Right? When you look at the skill level players, it probably favors the Falcons, but the defense definitely favors the Broncos. And when we look at the upcoming schedule for Atlanta, like I said earlier, the number one talking point after the big Kirk Cousins signing was the Falcons have the easiest schedule. They're going to run through an FCS schedule. But it hasn't really gone to Vegas' plan. I mean, look at the remaining games here. Now let's look at these teams' record and what their preseason win total was. The Broncos set a 5-5. Five five. They're one win away before Thanksgiving from cashing in on the over for their preseason win total. The Chargers are on pace to break their preseason win total. The Vikings have already beaten their preseason win total. The Raiders are not going to meet it. The Giants aren't going to meet it. The Commanders have already surpassed it. I mean, look at what was supposed to be an easy schedule. And you've got the Broncos, Chargers, Vikings, Commanders. Four out of their last seven opponents are all exceeding what the preseason projection was. So it's time to take that preseason easy schedule playoff prediction and crumple it all up and throw in the trash because it's not going to be a cakewalk. The Falcons, despite having what was supposed to be a bit of a cakewalk year, not a cakewalk at the end of the season. They've got some tough opponents, no doubt about it. So things for the Atlanta Falcons just got a little bit more interesting where they made a thought going into the year, hey, we've got a lot of veteran experience. we got Kirk Cousins coming here. we got the 32nd ranked schedule. We can breeze on through. Sitting at 6-4, and four, I'm still confident, but I'm losing confidence when I look at the way they played against the Saints and the way the rest of the schedule is shaking out with some tough opponents. I'm not abandoning the idea of this team making the playoffs. But I am losing faith on their ability to win in the playoffs if they don't get their act together in November. So how would you predict the Falcons' record for the rest of the year? Sitting at 6-4, and four, my preseason projection was 10-7. and 10-7 and seven looked bad two weeks ago. Now it's starting to come back into shape a little bit. So I'll stick with the preseason win total, I suppose. Seven games remaining. They go 4-3 and three in that stretch, and they win the NFC South, but they probably leave some meat on the bone in terms of getting the second seed in the NFC. Maybe a bit more favorable matchup in the wild card round, right? Instead of playing like a white-hot Commanders or Packers team, maybe you get the reeling Vikings who are coming down to earth. Sam Darnold, three interceptions in an ugly win over Mac Jones and the Jags on Sunday. I'd rather be playing the Vikings than a team like the Packers or Commanders who appear to be kind of going in the du correct, uh, correct direction. Now, next up on the show, I want to talk about some of the tough injury news the Falcons received after a, a very tough loss in the Big Easy and why this makes things even more interesting for Atlanta as they really learn about themselves and what their locker room is made of when it comes to the next man up mentality. But first, I do have to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Prize Picks. 
Prize Picks is America's number one spot for daily fantasy sports, where you can get real money action. With over 10 million members and billions of dollars in awarded winnings, Prize Picks has made daily fantasy sports accessible to all. Prize Picks puts their members first, so all withdrawals are fast, safe, and secure. When my pick hits, I can get my money in as quick as 15 minutes. The way it works is you just select two to six players and then pick more or less on their projected stat total. So every Tuesday, they do Taco Tuesday, which is just discounted stat totals. I'm going with the more on Jalen Brunson at 20 and a half points down from the usual 25. And then here are some NFL selections I have for Sunday as well. Download the app today and use code CLNS to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. All of that information is in the comments and description of today's video. Download the app today and use code CLNS to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Prize picks run your game. So let's run through some of the injury news for the Falcons coming out of Sunday's defeat. Taquan Graham, according to Raheem Morris, quote, not so good. He suffered a pec injury. This is just my guess. This is not anything I've heard. My guess is they're probably doing some level of testing to see if it's a full tear, a partial tear, if he can play through it, or if he needs season-ending injury. That's usually the way pec injuries go. But Morris having no concrete update on Monday Gives me a small sliver of hope that it might be not might not be season ending, but usually they can get some better pictures after 24, 48 hours of the injury and come away with a much more clear diagnosis. Uh, James Smith Williams only got told as an upper body injury, but not great was the way that Raheem Morris described it. So two key rotational players on your defensive line likely missing some time, if not a lot of time. Troy Anderson suffered a knee injury, re-aggravated the same knee injury he sustained the last time they played New Orleans. So I might put Anderson on probation from playing the Saints, which caused him to miss five games between the first time and the second time. So definitely not very uh, optimistic about his long-term health after suffering the same knee injury in a five-week span. And then Mike Hughes left the game with the neck injury. If you want some good news, this is it. He said, uh, more, more saying that, Hughes was cleared after getting an MRI, so they're optimistic that he'll be ready to roll as early as this upcoming Sunday. But three guys who are either starters or key rotational players on defense are in doubt for not just this week, but future weeks as well. So if they do miss, say, Taquan Graham and James Smith-Williams, my first guess is we're going to see a boatload of Arnold Ebicady, which we've already seen that. I think he even outsnapped Matthew Judon on Sunday, by the way. Maybe we get some more Malone on the field. We'll also see some practice squad elevations. Um, Harris came up in the practice squad, so there are a couple of guys that could get some extra runway going forward. So we'll also likely get maybe Brandon Dorless. Rukororo is on injured reserve for the next three weeks, so unfortunately not great timing because his number definitely would have been called, but a different rookie in Dorless might have an opportunity to get on the field for the first time this season, I believe. I don't think we've seen him more than once, if at all. Now, this news does coincide with a, another piece of injury news, which is Lorenzo Carter, who suffered a concussion in the win against the Panthers. He has been on injured reserve, has missed the last four weeks as a result. By my count, he is eligible to come off of IR, right? They put him on IR after the Panthers win, so his four games of mandatory time on IR is up. Hopefully, they can get him back as early as this Sunday because right now, they just need bodies. Like, you just lost one of your outside linebackers. You got to go and replace him, and getting someone back at the same time would at least uh, soften the blow a little bit. Now, watching Monday Night Football last night, I saw Calais Campbell make a couple of really nice plays. Really had me wondering, man, the Falcons make a big mistake letting Campbell and Bud Dupree walk in free agency. I mean, look at these two players that led the Falcons in sacks last year compared to what Grady Jarrett and Matthew Judon have been up to this year, the top two pass rushers on this team. I don't think it's really up for debate when I say the Falcons would have been better off bringing back at least one of those two guys. If the idea was, hey, we want to let the veterans go because we want to let some of the young rookies play, okay, I get that. 
but they're not playing. I mean, Rook and Dorless were both healthy scratches for the first month of the year. Then Rook finally gets himself onto the active game day roster. Doesn't have a super large role for him. You didn't go pass rusher in the first or second round, which was the biggest need of your team. Instead, you brought back veterans like Eddie Goldman and Contavious Street. You kick Zach Harrison from defensive end to defensive tackle, had him gain a bunch of weight so he can play more in the interior defensive line. And you put all your eggs in Lorenzo Carter, Arnold W. Cady, and a bounce back from Matthew Judon. 0 for 3 across the board so far. So how would you grade Terry Fontenot as a GM? Give me an A, B, C, D, or F. On one hand, he's made some really good selections when it comes to the draft. Robinson, London. But on the other hand, he's had three picks in the top ten. I sure hope so. He's got a really good chance of finding a good player when you're picking top ten three years in a row. I'm starting to cool off on Terry a little bit. I I know that this is just a broken record, but the trade deadline's going to haunt me after seeing what some other players went for and seeing the Falcons turn around the next week and still get zero sacks. The fourth time this year, by the way, they've had zero sacks in the game. We are past week 10, past the halfway point of the season, and Atlanta is the only team that does not have 10 or more sacks in the season. Disappointing. Before we sign off, I do want to give some shout-outs to the Dirty Birds Club. Thank you guys so much for being such loyal and devote supporters all season long. If you want to get added to the club, hang out with us during our watch party, Super Chat, and we'll throw you on screen for everyone watching to see all season long. That's going to do it for us on today's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to like the video, subscribe down below. That way you don't miss a single thing about your favorite squad.